happy birthday, Michelle. Um, rather than coming up with some awkward comments of my own, it turns out that I was privileged a few weeks ago to see the comments made by one of the giants in the field to describe Michelle Bouddard's work. And what is appealing about those, which I have to quote anonymously, is that they are true, and also that they have the credibility of one of the giants in the field, rather than my own, but also it was four lines long. That was the extent of the letter, which I quote anonymously again. His ideas and concepts have been seminal. His influence is pervasive in the field. And this is the best one of the three, and his students are absolutely superb. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with all three of them. <laughs> Probably the last one has the most exceptions. Well, to the matter at hand, in 15 minutes or less, I want to choose to talk about something that only towards the end will become connected with something that Michel Boudard has done. I'm going to talk about arcane, arcane isomerization, and in particular, I'm going to look at so fairly large arcanes. And I'm going to try to put as many branches as I can at those arcanes at a slower temperature as possible, with as environmentally acceptable a catalyst as I can. I would like to avoid the conventional catalysts that I use in this chemistry, which tend to be rather dangerous things to work with. They work at low temperature, they work for small arcanes, but they really crack this to pieces with great effectiveness. I would also like to avoid the high temperature catalysts, the metal zeolite materials, because when I get to those high temperatures, thermodynamics begins to get in my way in order to make those highly branched pieces. And what I need to do is I need to take something that looks like an acid catalyst, I need to make sure that they turn over at a lower temperature than they do right now, I need to figure out a way how to inhibit the cracking of those large arcanes that have too many opportunities to crack and few to isomerize, and I need to figure out a way of making more highly branched products. And I would like to begin, and actually talk for 10 minutes or so, about the class of materials that has become highly fashionable. And those are materials that even though they were discovered in 1962, it took some work in Japan a few years later to actually wake up some of the interest in the US. And these materials are actually what I would call anion modified oxides. If you take these kinds of oxides and you put sulfate and all the groups as you will find later, you will end up, in spite of the argument, there are over 100 papers in the literature right now that continue to argue as to whether it's a Bronsted acid site or a Lewis acid site. The fact is that these are the catalytically relevant one. And these are the ones that you ought to be trying to make, and those are the ones that you make after you optimize the catalyst. And two years after we tried to optimize the catalyst, we thought that we did. And at that point, it made sense to actually figure out how it actually works. The catalysts are made by a rather simple process. We know, for example, that the sulfate groups are on the surface because we can titrate them with a base. And we can count how many of them there are. And after you count all of them, you have about 0.25 of a monolith. If you cover the whole surface with sulfate groups, you're left with none of these groups here to provide for those protons. If you don't put enough of them, of course, you don't have you know, an acid site. Another interesting story that takes about half an hour is that platinum is well dispersed, but it's not reduced. And it turns out that even though they're crystallized by microscopy are quite small, the percentage metal exposed by hydrogen chemisorption is actually quite small. Well, let me show you some of the great things about this catalyst and some of the limitations. The rate for N-hexane isomerization at a fairly low temperature, about 200 Celsius, in exon units is 0.38 grams of hexane per gram of catalyst per hour. In Stanford units is about 3.2 times 10 to the minus 2 per second. So on both accounts, they're fairly respectable rates. There's some problems with it. The first one is illustrated here, where I look at what the composition of the isomers are and I normalize them to 2-methyl pentane. The fact is that the singly branch isomers are almost equilibrated with each other. The doubly branched are equilibrated with each other. But once you get a quaternary carbon in there, you're no longer equilibrated. And the reason is very simple. It is very difficult by acid catalysis to do this kind of rearrangement, which turns a tertiary into a secondary convenient line. The other difficulty is that as long as I want to do hexane, I don't have a problem. If I look now at the cracking selectivity versus the chain size of the arcane, what I see is I'm almost totally selected to isomerization as long as I don't go past this magical C6. 
Once I get to C7, C8, C10, and C12, what happens is I open off the opportunity for having large and all bleeding groups, and all of a sudden my cracking selectivity takes over. My challenges are the following, to increase the rate even beyond where they are today, to try to decrease that cracking selectivity, and to the extent that I can to increase the selectivity of those, to those dimethyl isomers. Let's look for a second at what the selectivity looks like as we change the residence time or the conversion on this catalyst. And the fact is that if I look now at turnover rates for isomerization and cracking, they are in such a manner as to keep the total rate constant, but the isomerization rate decreases as I increase the residence time, whereas the cracking rate increases. It is a classical case of a reabsorption of these species here that go back onto the surface and get another chance to go through a dangerous intermediate that can do beta scission and can give you the cracking products. Well, but the fact is that even at zero residence time, even after one sojourn on that surface, there is a finite probability that this species will crack. And that's what that initial turnover rate or that initial cracking selectivity is giving you right there. So what do I need to do? I need to get these things off the surface quickly before they do something like this. And with the benefit of hindsight, I have decided to take it off the surface by what is called a hydrogen transfer step which I'm going to take one of these hydrocarbons reacted there by a hydride shift and get it off the surface that way. How do I know that that is the mechanism? Because we spent a while trying to figure out what the mechanism was. And there were two possibilities. One of the possibilities is that you have the classical bifunctional mechanism in which the metal goes and equilibrated hydrogenation and dehydrogenation, and the acid size then do what they like to do. They protonate olefins and they give you the products that you actually observe. A more likely mechanism at low temperatures, where thermodynamics do not really favor the formation of olefins, is what is called a chain transfer mechanism, in which you replace one carbocation with another one by hydride type transfer mechanisms. This is usually a first order reaction in the alkane and a negative order reaction in hydrogen because of this equilibrium right here. This one is usually not. So if you look at what the kinetics actually look like, those kinetics are on alkane. On alkane, they're very low order. And on hydrogen, they're actually positive order. And that's unusual in the sense that it does not resemble most of the high temperature bifunctional type reaction mechanisms. So now, if this is the case, and I'm left with my challenge to increase the rate of the reaction, to decrease the resonance time of that intermediate so that it doesn't crack, what I ought to be doing is I ought to be looking at things that can do this more efficiently than what I have right now. And what I have right now are linear and isomeric alkanes sitting in that system. So with the help of someone at Exxon that had a great deal of experience in this area, we actually came up with one possible solution. But first of all, suppose that you want to come up with a co-catalyst. And that co-catalyst is one that you want to use in order to get a hydrogen from one place to the other one. What should you look for? And the concepts of catalysis begin to show us what we should be looking for. One of these steps has to form an XH bond, and one has to break it. And in order to be able to cycle around here without much destruction of that species, I need to be sitting where the energy of that XH bond is neither too low so I form the bond, nor too high, so that I never break the bond once I have made it. So somewhere in here I want to be. I want also a catalyst where I have access to that hydrogen and not be restricted by any steric effects. And I also want, if I truly want a co-catalyst, something that does not get consumed or destroyed as part of the overall cycle. And with the help of George Kramer, who had done a great deal of work, in this area, we actually came up with something that is not an inorganic catalyst, but actually an organic catalyst, co-catalyst for this reaction. It is a molecule called adamante that has four identical hydrogens. It is a very unreactive molecule, except it will form a carbocation by transferring one of these hydrides, and then it will regenerate itself again and again. It's a rather expensive molecule. Now, the question is, how effective is it compared to this species that you already have in the system that are doing that hydride transfer reaction? Well, 
If it's more effective on those species, we ought to get an increase in the rate and a decrease in the cracking selectivity as a result of having that hydride transfer agent there. And if I look at the turnover rates now as a function of adamantane concentration in the system, what I get is I get an increase in the total rate as I increase the adamantane concentration. The remarkable thing is that this effect occurs when I have one molecule of adamantane for each 200 molecules of heptane. So it must be a very good thing that takes you from here to here by a factor of three. What is more remarkable is that it is the isomerization rate that is increasing. In other words, I'm getting these things off of the surface much faster than before, and I have restricted the rate at which I actually crack those carbocations on that surface. So I have accomplished two of my goals. One of them is to increase the rate of turnover by increasing the rate of chain propagation. The other one is to decrease the probability that this will crack by getting it off the surface quickly. Well, maybe the selectivity issue there is not clear, so let me look at it here. Remember, it depends on conversion. This is the cracking to isomerization ratio of the two rates, the selectivity increasing for normal heptane as a function of conversion. This is the rate when you have 0.8%, one molecule for every 200 hydrocarbons of adamantane, and two things are clear. The selectivity to cracking has decreased dramatically, and also the intercept, wherever it may be, the intrinsic probability of cracking after one surface suture is no longer finite, but is probably very near zero. So I have decreased the residence time of this species, I have gathered off of the surface more rapidly, and now they're not around long enough to do the undesirable side reaction. Two things became clear as we were doing this, and those were that there were things present in the system that also acted as hydrogen transfer agent. This is what happens when I increase the pressure of hydrogen. Hydrogen is not considered a hydride transfer agent, but it turns out it is. The cracking selectivity decreases. Look at what happens when I lower the concentration of heptane, one of the other possible hydrogen transfer agents. The selectivity to cracking increases. So hydrogen is helping me to get this off the surface as adamantane did, and lowering the amount of heptane in the system is slowing down the rate of hydrogen transfer and is staying on that surface a longer period of time. Now finally, if we look at the rates rather than the selectivity and show that indeed you have hydrogen transfer going on, let me look at three types of hydrogen transfer co catalysts adamantane, dihydrogen, and heptane. In all cases, as I increase the concentration of any of those three, I get an increase in the rate of isomerization. It is acting as a co catalyst, right? But look at the ranges that I have here for each one of them. 2,500 kPa of hydrogen, 250 kPa of normal heptane, 0.25 kPa of adamantane. This gives you an idea of the potency of those species as hydrogen transfer agents, but the fact is that all three of them are working in the same manner. They're working as to terminate one of these carbocations and replace it with another one, and therefore lower the chances that it will stay there long enough to actually produce a cracking product. Well, this brings me for a second now to where Michelle's contribution came in, and hopefully I have the three or four minutes required in order to do it. This is what we found. This was known as a hydrogen transfer agent. These two were really not considered to be hydrogen transfer agents for this particular type of catalyst. This one here is one in which the platinum is actually playing a role of being the generators of this hydrides and protons, and on the one hand, terminating a carbocation, and on the other one, replacing the proton that is no longer there. Now, if we believe that to be the case, and the evidence is that indeed this is going on, and it's a hydrogen transfer mechanism, then our goal is going to be to replace platinum or to aid platinum with something else that will make it even better at storing this hydrogen and transferring to this hydrocarbons. And I would like to leave you with work that is less than six weeks old, in which we attempted to do something very simple. We went away from sulfated zirconia and we went to tungstated zirconia. Why? Because a few years ago there was a report that these materials, now this is a tungsten, not a sulfur group, were actually very good. As a catalyst, they had a very good Hammond indicator that were more, more stronger than sulfuric acid, but there was a problem with making it. Well, we were able to make it. 
But we also knew from work done in Michel Bogart's group that tungsten oxide groups on the surface of tungsten carbides are actually very good acid catalysts. And they have very high selectivity to isomerization. And finally, we knew that there may be a way in which we can aid that hydrogen transfer step, because the early work of Cuvier and the later work of Boudard actually showed that you can actually put WO3 on the surface of some catalyst, you can put platinum around, and you can actually generate this reduced WO3 species, which will store hydrogen, possibly in the form of a hydride type species. So what should the result be of having this, that, and that? It ought to be a higher rate of reaction and a lower cracking selectivity. And that is what we found, except the extent to which it improves the catalyst was more remarkable than we thought it would. The fact is that the isomerization rate for normal heptane increases, although not remarkably. Now notice with the benefit of hindsight, we use sulfur here as the normalizing parameter and tungsten here, so it is the acid site that we're normalizing the rate to. At the same conversion, the cracking to isomerization ratio has gone from near unity to almost zero. We're getting these things off the surface very, very quickly. And because we're getting them off the surface very, very quickly, we're actually having a hard time putting two and three methyl species on that carbon cation. Notice what we have done. We have been able to accomplish what we set out to accomplish. The rate has increased, and we have several modes of doing it. The selectivity to cracking has decreased, but however, we're in a catch-22 situation, because the same short residence time that actually causes us not to crack is not giving enough time for the carbon cations to go the next more difficult step, which is to put another methyl branch on that hydrocarbon. So let me summarize by saying that I think we know how to accomplish many of these things. And we know now something about the relative potency of this hydrogen transfer agents. We know that this is indeed a very effective one and can be aided further by the presence of something that resembles an interstitial hydride type species. We know that whenever we increase the rate of those hydrogen transfer steps, we desorb those isomers more quickly. Therefore, we decrease the residence time of the carbocation and inhibit secondary reactions. And the problem is that some secondary reactions we want and some secondary reactions we don't want, and we can tell them apart because both of them are changing as we change that carbocation residence type. If we leave it there, we can put additional branches on that chain, but if we leave it there, we also have a larger probability, more of a chance of actually doing those beta scission reactions. So it is a good news, and it is a bad news, in the sense that we now know how to do as much as we can do, we also know how much we cannot do. And maybe it is time to move to a different kind of material to try to get those highly branched hydrocarbons that we insist on wanting to have from those linear actions. I'd like to just acknowledge the contributions of two people. George Kramer, who at Exxon was the one that guided us in the uh, hydrogen transfer adamantane work, and Dave Barton, a graduate student in our department who's begun to do some work on the constant oxide basis. Thank you. exactly the same thing. It turns out that in the, in the presence of a large amount of hydrogen, adamantane no longer has an effect because there's enough hydrogen transfer to the hydrogen. In the presence of a large amount of adamantane, hydrogen has almost no effect on the overall rate. So the, the, the proposal is that both adamantane and hydrogen are doing the same thing. 
They're actually providing for a source of that hydride, or at least a reservoir for that hydride to do the hydrogen transfer. And I call it hydrogen hydride because I think to speak of a free hydride is a very dangerous thing to do. And these are solvated type species, none of which have ever seen or probably will ever be seen. But the fact is that they are there. So hydrogen, they are hydride. Um, what do you conclude about the uh, uh, olefin and uh, uh, the final isomerization of the olefin and uh, the hybridization mechanism? Well, what I concluded is not the um, predominant path that the conditions that we're carrying out in chemistry. It becomes a predominant path as you go to much higher temperatures where olefins become a viable intermediate. Now, it is easy to fool oneself because if you actually take label olefins and you mix them with your paraffin, find out that the product actually contains primarily the label from the oil. So you will conclude that olefins are reactive intermediate, and indeed they are. But there aren't enough of them around to do very much of that chemistry. If you look at the thermodynamics of dehydrogenation at 200 degrees and about 20 atmospheres of hydrogen, there aren't enough of those intermediates. So it is not the predominant mechanism. 